Um, I was laying in bed last night thinking about where I was a year ago and uh, kind of feeling sorry for myself that I wasn't with you guys in Portland. Uh, but then I got this big picture of a REACH team and lots of kind words from you all, so I just wanted to thank you for that. It really picked me up. The other thing that, uh, and this is right after I had my stem cell transplant and I g got back on my feet and we started walking around downtown South Lake Union and I really liked passing this station, this fueling station, because uh, one, I was always interested in what the cost of biodiesel was and this is a 10% um, blend I believe and uh, just, just a little bit more than regular diesel. But they took the time to put up these uh, billboards as well, counting the amount of CO2 that they were saving uh, by the gallon that they were um, selling. And so this is one of the reasons we're in the game. So um, I'd like to talk to you about the work that is going on with legumes and oil seeds. Um, this is at the center of one of our four major objectives and approaches to mitigating and adapting to climate change from a cropping system standpoint. Uh, the others being nitrogen management. We're going to hear a lot about site-specific nitrogen this, this afternoon. Reduced tillage and direct seeding. There's quite a bit of uh, work going on that you'll hear in this conference. And then organic amendment recycling. Some really exciting work coming out of our collaboration with Craig Cogger on uh, rates of carbon accumulation in soils and, and what kinds of soil fractions those are going into. But we'll, we'll focus on the legumes and oil seeds today. And this is Dave's uh, 2009 map just uh, overlaid with where the oil seed and legume work has or is ongoing. Uh, across the region. So you can see that almost all of the sites have some work with these alternative crops. And um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the really nice experiments set up by one of our collaborators, and this is mostly funded out of uh, actually the Washington Biofuels Project, but I consider him a REACH collaborator as well because he's uh, set up this intensification and diversification project in the irrigated area uh, at Patterson, so he works out of Prosser. And um, basically, he's set up a system where he's getting four harvests of either grain or um, animal feed out of two years. And so you start out with, in the upper left hand uh, with fresh peas grown, uh, early harvest, enough time to establish a, a winter canola crop that then grows up vegetatively and you can get a good harvest of about a ton per acre out of that before the winter hits. The biennial canola then overwinters and produces a nice grain crop of over two tons per acre the next year and that comes off early enough that you can then plant a, a, corn, a late corn crop for uh, more silage for animal feed. So it's really nice uh, design for uh, attacking exactly what we're interested in with REACH. There's another project at, at Prosser looking at this uh, issue of cover crops and use of cover crops in, in the basin and we started this a long time ago but uh, re renewed interest in cover crops now with NRCS and so this is coming up again and we've got uh, uh, a project looking at a potato rotation with as much cover cropping as we could, could put into it. And so mustard, uh, another brassica crop, is, is being used as a, a bridge from one summer crop to another to uh, protect the soil, recycle some nitrogen. Move to the drier area and at Ralston, really exciting work going on with high residue farming with Frank uh, Young squared, Frank Young and Lauren Young, not related. Uh, but they're growing some tall triticale, producing a lot of residue in this low rainfall area. And then using a stripper header, which just skims off the grain and leaves a lot of tall standing stubble. 
and they leave it standing and then plant right into that. And so you've got this kind of umbrella over, over the crop and they've planted some canola in it. Uh, lower soil temperatures, more moisture up at the soil surface, better seed, seed conditions. So that's, that's a really exciting project. Um, <clears throat> then moving up the road a bit uh, to Ritzville, and Bill Schillinger is doing some nice work and uh, looking at this question of how early can you seed canola. There's quite a bit of interest in this. Uh, establish a good stand while there is surface moisture uh, earlier in the fallow season, and then letting it grow up, get a nice large size plant to get through the winter. Uh, but then the trade-off everybody kind of qualitatively recognized was that um, you're going to use up more soil moisture. And um, this puts some quantitative data to that question. You can definitely see more uh, soil moisture being drawn down yeah. um, with the earlier planting on June 10th on the uh, left-hand side of the circles. Um, so severe depletion of soil moisture, how that affects overwintering, and then the next grain yield the next season remains to be seen. Ty Moz has been doing some really great work at Wilkie and uh, Palouse Conservation Farm. And uh, she's, she and Ashley Hammock uh, generated enough site years to put together nice relationships between precipitation and grain yield which will help us predict future uh, uh, canola yields based on precipitation. And then also, what is the uh, nitrogen supply requirement? So we'll be re re uh, rewriting the guides. And um, Dave at, at Cook Farm has also uh, produced some relationships between yield and, and seeding date. And so it's really critical for winter can or, uh, spring canola to seed it early if possible. Of course, that's all dependent on whether you can get into the field and whether you have uh, too wet of seeding conditions. And then you uh, also have dangers of early seedlings, freezing stress. Uh, some really nice work at, at Pendleton showing that uh, instead of wheat fallow, you can put in a wheat spring pea crop, Stephen Machado's work at Pendleton, and suffer no uh, detriment to the winter wheat yield. So replacing fallow wherever possible. Uh, or oh, at the same time, did something similar to that at Morrow and found a dramatic decrease. So there's, there's kind of a line of precipitation where you can pull that off and, and uh, that will vary from season to season as well. So I'm really, going back to Ty Maz's work, um, looking at spring canola yields and uh, how re residual fertilizer affects uh, pea yields and actually um, seeing that the more fertilizer applied to the canola actually affected, beneficially affected the pea yields. Uh, she didn't feel it, it was actually residual nitrate, that it was either organic nitrogen or some other effect on the soil biology. Um, she also get, got an estimate of how much biological nitrogen fixation was going on uh, based on some nitrogen balance work. And more, more fixation at Pullman than at Wilkie, as might be expected. Uh, more history of legume production at Pullman. So build, building up those rhizobial populations, even though both crops were uh, inoculated with rhizobium, that having uh, soil rhizobial populations add to that, apparently. And this was verified by uh, Rita Abi Ganab and Pat Okabara with some really nice uh, DNA marker work. And then, uh, okay, that is my bell. <laughs> so, uh, winter peas also in the mix at Ritzville, and that's, that's a pretty dry area and getting some great yields there. Uh, we're impacting a lot of the model, <laughs> and I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.